Welcome to the Libertarian Crusader Show, episode number 30. And today we have a, a show that we've been waiting to do for a long time, have a good establishment going on. But uh, we have Christianity in the name of, uh, in terms of uh, a nod to Crusaders. So inevitably, this is a great opportunity to talk about libertarianism and its compatibility with Christianity. And we have a special guest uh, with John and I, uh, Justin Walsh, uh, who's a Western uh, Orthodox Tradcath. And I think it's, uh, it brings a lot of good knowledge and good wealth to the discussion of libertarianism and Christianity. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, your, your background a bit, uh, Justin? Sure, I'll, I'll do it as quick as possible. The, uh, I grew up a, a Republican. In fact, my, my, my father joked with me when I was oh, around 10 or 11 years old that we only had you because we needed more Republican votes. <laughs> um, and uh, a Goldwater Republican most of my life. And then um, it, um, and I just missed voting. I never voted for Reagan because two, I missed it by two years. Um, no, I was, um, I was a Goldwater Republican. Um, when I finally found out that that doesn't exist in the Republican Party anymore, um, I started moving on and I started paying more attention to Ron Paul. Um, and then I started reading other things. Um, you know, the, the, the first things were, uh, you know, Bastiat, the law, Henry ha Hazlitt, um, economics in one lesson, then, you know, read human action. But I have, I have never gotten into some of the, the stuff from Mises and other stuff that you all have. Um, most of mine was based on, I was my whole life, a uh, follower of Ayn Rand, read the books over and over and over again. My favorite was her shortest one, which is Anthem. I think it, that had the, the uh, biggest impact on me. Um, but no, I'm, I, most of my libertarianism came from frustration out of the practical world where other people may have studied. I haven't studied most of, much of the libertarian um, literature, but uh, when I started applying for permits, when I started doing things in real life and seeing the cost of um, government, um, you start to get more, a little bit more into it or a little more opposed to it, I guess. Right. So. Anyway, and I grew up a Catholic, and I've, uh, I, as far as the religious part, I, I grew up a Catholic. Um, I became very traditional Catholic, and then for some reason, I moved on to evangelicalism and Protestant. You know, tried every type of uh, different church, and it just wasn't cutting it. Um, went back to um, Catholicism, but there were no Tridentine masses around, and um, then I just tried Orthodoxy. And there was everything sort of fit. And it was sort of felt like I wasn't leaving Catholicism. Though I think most Catholics will tell you I did, but um, it just didn't feel like I was. So, yeah, I was, uh, I almost had an interest in going to um, an Orthodox church. Um, if it wasn't for John pointing out that there was a uh, Latin mass uh, service <laughs> right behind my house. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It was like, uh, well, I think this is just making sense. You know, right. Hal bought this house for a reason and that's probably to, uh, <laughs> to go to church uh, <laughs> a few yards away. <laughs> I could walk there. It's amazing. Um, so you mentioned Anne Rand, a uh, great influence uh, to me as well. And then like what great start to say of uh, libertarianism compatibility with Christianity since uh, one of her books is like the one uh, second highest uh, read, I think uh, next to the Bible. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Atlas Shrugged. Um, so like, like right there, I think you find uh, a lot of similarities. I think a, a good place to start with this would be uh, talking about uh, what is libertarianism, right? When we talk about Christianity in terms of its ethics and uh, I mean, we can go to the commandments and all, but I guess a good first start would be uh, defining libertarianism. And would you like to give that a shot, John? Well, it, yeah. Or Justin? Yeah. No, no, let John do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at it like um, just the non-aggression principle, you know, as long as um, you're not uh, engaging in physical force against someone else in terms of theft, fraud, violence, um, you know, uh, that's, that's, the main, that's the main gist. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I, there's a lot of libertarians throughout history and today who are obviously Christians. So there's, it seems like there's not a lot of people who, who, you know, don't agree with that basic definition. Right. There's, uh, in, in terms of libertarianism, you have uh, not just property rights, you have a lot of uh, philosophy that do espouse it, but one way or another, they create these exceptions 
of who can own what, and they always involve invariably the initiation of force uh, in their theories. And libertarianism is the only one that uh, espouses uh, being against the initiation of force. And that uh, not just having property rights, but having who gets to own what and how is that ownership justified. And the way they approach it is through two ways, home loan, uh, home stand, uh, homesteading, unowned resources, and title transfership of uh, property rights or property that you own. Um, and that's it. Any other way, every other philosophy out there kind of espouses you in one way or another, there's initiation of force involved. Uh, so you, yeah, so it goes back to like the non-aggression principle. It's an ethical relationship. And uh, you'll find then, as we're going to discuss, uh, Christianity provides a very similar ethical relationship that's kind of grounded in the non-initiation of force. Um, so I guess uh, we could start off with uh, the first one that a lot of people kind of go to is like they are, they think it's the kryptonite and that's uh, Romans 13. <laughs> and I, often, I do have friends sometimes who will, will, will point that out and then bring that up. Non, uh, Non-Christian friends? Non-Christian, right. Yeah. Non-Christian friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, let's take this thing that I don't believe, but you have to believe. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then, of course, I think there's uh, the good uh, Bible that uh, John uh, referenced to me that I think it's a great one to have is uh, Doi Rhymes' uh, Bible. And uh, very little in terms of historical translation, just maybe two or three going from... uh, Greek to Latin, and then strictly straight to English, yep. uh, done in France. Uh, back, I guess these were people who had to escape uh, England during uh, their, their own persecution and then felt they just needed to have a straight translation and not a King Henry translation or, uh, or any kind of uh, government from there. Uh, and so, it's some t- so I could see where, like, we're going to talk about render to Caesar what it says, but like somewhere in their version, I still write like taxation, right? They'll change some words. Ninety-nine uh, percent of all the of all the texts are similar, but th- their translations are sometimes can be off. And I find the Doi Ryan's Bible to be a really good, legit authority on it, and one which uh, Justin Walls has a great response to Romans thirteen coming from the text. Um, yeah, I, sadly, I don't have enough light here. I don't know if one of you all do you want to just go through the thing slowly then, or sure, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me see if I can even see this with my glasses because <laughs> I don't have a light right above me. Sorry about that. It depends. And um, also, if you want me to uh, share uh, your translation, I could just pull it up on my browser. Yeah, will you do it? Yeah, so because I can great. barely yeah. see this. One thing on me, my eyes aren't great, and I'm sitting kind of in the dark there. Yeah. Are you looking uh, up the Douay? Yeah. I'm, I'm in the Douay, uh, 1752. I think it's the same one that you have. Yeah. So let me. Uh, oh, wait. How about I do this? Sorry, folks. Technical difficulties. Slow. This is a passage where they're often <laughs> say that it well, commands. I will powers. say it's the first two. Um, um, one and two, if there, so if you go to Romans 13, one and two, um, most people just drop the mic after that. All right. So here we go. I'm sharing it there now. We, so Romans uh, 13, do I reams? Yeah. So the first, um, one and two, um, 13, one and two, it, it kind of goes through there. It's saying, let everyone be subject to higher powers. Um, you know, if you resist those powers, you bring damnation on yourself. I mean, I'm just par- paraphrasing. Um, so, and, and most people will drop the mic but they don't read far past that um, because then when you read past that, it, um, it starts describing what authority is. And by the way, in there, they never say anything about government. They never use the word government. It's always power or authority. And I think as libertarians, we don't reject authority or rules. Is that true? Right. We, we don't. I mean, every private event has someone in charge, I, I believe. Right. Um, and they have rules for a reason. And it's basically saying that same thing. So when there is authority, you, you should obey it for, for good reason. Um, but it doesn't necessarily tell you that it's government. Does that make any sense? Or at least in a good translation. And it's also um, Young's literal translation, King James and the Dewey, which probably are the best um, translations you can use. None of them use the word government. Right. There's uh, oftentimes... Um Libertarians or new to the scene or anarcho-capitalists will come in and thinking uh, 
they forget that government has hijacked a lot of these things that the market has created and societies have created like uh, like laws and stuff like that or authority and they'll hijack these terms like the post office right now will claim that it's a private entity when they get, when it's a monopoly, right? They like to purport themselves to be a real business, but no other business can get like zero free interest loans at the million rates that they get per year. Um, but yeah, they forget that uh, we don't want uh, a lot of the things the government has are their monopoly on laws and a lot of the rules that we just don't agree with. And their yep. rules are oftentimes not universal. Um, authority lies with that. Um, a lot of people think authority, they think cops, they think uh, the state, they think all oh, authority therefore is bad, but they forget there's also authority in dentistry, right? Uh, the person, the orthodontist that looks at your teeth and his authority comes from uh, voluntary interactions. He's not forcing himself into your mouth. Um, the doctor that has uh, nurses and people that are there to help him to assist, uh, he, although he has to, so they'll, they'll think authority has to enforce rules, but his enforcement of the rules in that setting in a, a surgery, for example, is enforcing uh, cleaning nets, for example, uh, procedures that have kind of built up over time to make sure that the patient doesn't die from uh, diseases or infections and make sure that the staff and the nurses wear gloves, for example. And if they don't, uh, he enforces their removal or enforces that they wash their hands or, or leave, right? Um, so I think there's, there's two kinds of authorities that people don't understand. There's that illegitimate one and there's a legitimate one, a justified one. And I think that word and, sometimes throws people off in itself. And in the very next... Right after one and two, when you get to the beginning of three, I'm going to put the glasses on and attempt to read here or get a light here, have an intermission and get a light. But let me uh, see if I can see this. But I mean, right after that, it says, for princes are not a terror to good work, but to evil. That kind of tells me it's setting up a prescription or it tells you what is legitimate and illegitimate authority. Um, I mean, right after they tell you that, that you need to submit to it, they say, here's what a legitimate authority is. So if you're, we're doing good work, and I usually just end up asking somebody, is, um, is building a road evil? Mm. Is marrying, getting married evil? No. If you go farther into it later on when it says, it does not wield the sword in vain, but does so to punish those who would do evil, it's simple as this. I mean, government is, I mean, or authority is there to, to stop people from doing evil. That's it. It has no other prescription in Romans 13. None. And to me, the more government would just indicate a failure in society. So if we have to have more and more government, wouldn't that tell you that more and more evil is being done? Hmm. So that would be a failure of society. But anyway, it, um, it, um, it, it only prescribes to stop evil from being done. So is setting up a business evil? Is providing a service for your, um, your, your neighbor evil? Right. Yeah. The assumption is, well, um, people would, you know, without government subduing them or um, extracting resources out of them, they would be engaged in evil, you know, and, and they would, uh, yeah, they would engage, be engaged in all these evil acts with their businesses. So we regulate, you know, those businesses with these licenses, and permits to ensure that, yeah, they don't do those evil things. Right. <laughs> um, but it, in, the, in a text, it doesn't allow for that. That, that's a problem from a Christian point of view, maybe a, a, an atheist or, you know, point of view that you, they could use that logic. But from in this text, the one that people go to, it doesn't provide for the assumption of someone doing something down. It's there to stop if someone does something evil. So if you are going about your business doing what's right, um, getting married, um, which is a metaphysical institution. In fact, I, I don't want to jump off too much, but Pope Leo warned us about um, back in 1860 or 70 about uh, in humanum genus, I think is what it was about um, marriage becoming a, uh, a civil institution or a civil right. Um, and he warned against it. And he said, in, in fact, he used the word nominally Catholic countries, marriage is becoming a civil institution. Gee, what's happened to it? Right. Um, he, and that was back in about 1868 or 70, I think. Um, but anyway, sorry to jump off on that. But the text doesn't provide um, anywhere in it to govern every aspect of our lives. And it doesn't even provide necessarily to have a democratic govern governance. It just means authority, which can, can mean familial, anything that is consensual. Sort of like your old videos when you were at VCU and you were big on the consent thing. 
if it's not consensual, I don't think it prescribes it in, in here. Right. Is that, did I go, did I go off on something else? Did that make sense or? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I like your prescription in that. You no, know, it doesn't say anything of um, what government then does it prescribe then? Right. If people take that to mean that this is a authority from government, then what kind of government does it say that you need? Right. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't, right. <laughs> it, it doesn't. And I mean, if, if we can assume things, I mean, Bastiat says we have the right to uh, contract with others to uh, protect our rights. Correct. Right. So that's sort of like, it, it would look very much like a police force, but it would be private. Um, and if someone offends my rights, I could join a co-op that is, to, you know, a, a people to, um, that would use force to protect my rights. Um, if someone violates my rights, I can, I can join one of those groups and it's, and it's with consent. It's voluntary. Um, and I think that fills everything inside of this, um, in the text. I think it it um, it satisfies everything in the text. You know, to me, this Roman, Romans thirteen. I've always, when I've read it, I, I I see it as a discussion of more the church than than government. Like, and the church is something everybody knows that you when you go to church, and they hand the basket around, and uh, you you put you know money in the basket. And when I see you know um, thir- um, Romans thirteen six. For therefore also you pay tribute, for they are the ministers of God serving under this purpose, render therefore to all men their dues. So I just think, well, people do that voluntarily anyway when they go to church. They don't have to. And um, yep. why is it that government doesn't do it voluntarily? Like the Pope's not putting a gun to anybody's head or breaking down their door if they don't donate 50 bucks a month or something. So it's, um, it, it, you do wonder, clearly the church is doing something that people want and government is not. Right, and sure. they also happen to be one of the largest uh, philanthropic group in the world, uh, especially here in the United States, and the amount of charity uh, and money that goes to so many countless uh, programs that um, you know, people should bring more of a highlight to. Um, and if we can, and if the church and that community can fund this stuff voluntarily, um, you know, why can't government? Or why can't uh, we provide the same funding for these services that government purports to provide? Uh, yeah, and, and to follow uh, what John was reading there, uh, and it says, uh, uh, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth his neighbor hath fulfilled the law. For thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Uh, and so I find, like, even in the following line, nowhere in here do you find uh, a sense of... Uh, violating that consent <laughs> all of this is telling you to kind of respect one another to love one another and to treat each other uh with fairly uh with not stealing with not pro- violating property rights um so i mean these are all good things i can't see how anyone can kind of derive from his 13 then to be a very uh <laughs> anti-libertarianism because libertarianism also espouses these views right uh, yeah right don't steal don't murder uh the whole non-aggression principle uh, form of ethic. And, you know, I, I think part of the problem is the, the translation everyone uses. If they use one of the three translations, you know, whether this do a reams, the King, J- the old King James or uh, Young's literal few others, I'm sure they wouldn't come to this conclusion. And then some people just want to come to that conclusion. Right. Yeah. Some people want to come to that conclusion so they can justify their authority That's yeah. very true. or their uh, form of government. It's very true. Or uh, there's a lot of edgy claims out there, and that's kind of like one of them <laughs> that they go to. Um, but yeah, I, I do like this one, one last line here. It's, uh, it's kind of very, uh, I don't know if um, this is just like an Ezekiel thing that is said in Pulp Fiction, but it's very similar along to the line where he says, for he is God's minister to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, fear. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath upon him that doth evil. Yeah. And that's the only prescription it gives is for people that, so, and, 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 I, and I, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but go back to the things we do every day, that we help um, other people voluntarily. 
um, and they require a license. Well, let's say feeding someone in the park. You have people that are that are homeless and you feel like feeding them because that's what we're called to do. Um, but we need to get a license for it. I'm not sure how from that text someone justifies getting a license to feed homeless people or to clothe them um, or to shelter them. That's not evil. That's good. So the government has no authority, in, or at least derived from this text, to license doing good. It's only there to stop evil. And they, even that, I wouldn't say the government, it's any authority, right. any th- whether it's private police or not. Does, right. Fair enough? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's Romans 13. I think uh, we nailed that one out of the park. <laughs> Let's go on to uh, render unto Caesar what is his. Uh, or I guess if uh, government were onto Bitcoin, render unto Satoshi what it says. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I pulled it up uh, over here. So this is Mark um, 12, chapter 12, 13 through about 17. So uh, it's, it says, so, and they went to, they went, they sent to him some Pharisees and of the Herodians that they should catch him in his words who coming say to him, Master, we know that thou art a true speaker and carest not for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God and truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar, or shall we not give it? Who, knowing their will wiliness, saith to them, Why tempt you me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it to him. And he saith to them, Whose is this image and inscription? They say to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God, the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Right. I think if um, Jesus was about all about taxes, he would have just said, pay your taxes, right? Pay your taxes. Three words, right? <laughs> <laughs> he would have made your, it a very share. Sure. Right. <laughs> Well, the the question was asked because they probably assumed he was the type that was going to say, don't pay it. And they wanted him to get in trouble with the authorities, the government authorities. So that's why the question, their assumption alone, I mean, they're assuming he's going to come out and say it, but he didn't. But he didn't say support government either. I mean, he I mean, I can imagine he looks at the coin, sets it aside and just says, give under render under seat under Caesar. Um, but doesn't really answer the question. And then that's why they got frustrated and left. Right. So he really didn't answer the question. So that's not a very good um, text for justifying taxes either. It kind of reminds me of um, Joan of Arc was asked a very similar question to kind of have her trip up on herself to find things that they can trial, put her on trial and burn her for it. Right. So one of the questions that they asked her was if she was in a state of grace and her response was, uh, if I am not in a state of grace, may God put me there. And if I am, may God so keep me. And I was like, that's, she has answered the question, but not answered the yeah. question that they're trying to make her for sure to say. And it's a very good way of uh, Jesus also responding to that. Um, and, uh, one way that I've uh, seen it as a response to it would be, I know if all things have, are created by God and all things belong to God, then, um, then nothing belongs to Caesar. All things belong to God. So therefore render nothing to Caesar. I agree. Right. Yeah. And I mean, to add a, I guess something I just thought of really, I mean, wasn't, so Judas was the guy who he was the treasurer, right? He held the money and obviously it didn't turn out well for him, but you do think, I mean, surely Christ was handling money or had to eat food or, you know, it, the apostles needed food. And, um, you know, I, I have to assume, and he seems to, he exhibits in the parables so many examples of understanding money and understanding uh, like a return on investment, even, you know, with uh, the, the servants who give, um, the, they're each given talents and one is given a lot and one is given few. And, um, it, you know, the, the master demands that they make something out of these and get a return on investment, you know, and that just seems, so it, it, it seems like he's not afraid to talk about these, about issues of money, but his, his bigger purpose is obviously, you know, the kingdom of God, not, um, 
taxation, you know, and, <laughs> and I think as libertarians, you know, we're concerned that, you know, is, and as Christians, you know, I think number one, that's our number one concern, you know, and, and we're always reminding ourselves of that. That's a good point. Right. Uh, it takes away, I guess, sometimes yeah. the other focus on that and that, uh, Christianity is not really so much heavily focused <laughs> on these kind of issues. Um, and libertarianism and the study therefore of, of it is a very uh, area of, of a lot of economic interest for us. So of course, taxation is on the forefront of our minds and in, uh, in a lot of our discussions. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a good point for that. Um, and I think if Jesus was okay with it, he would just spell it out in three simple words, you know, but he didn't. I think um, some of these things, like in terms of that, like the way they were trying to trick him, trip him up in his words to get him prosecuted or arrested even, uh, reminds me of um, uh, Paul's letter, right? This is another one that sometimes, uh, like libertarians are anti-slavery, right, naturally, or in terms of our uh, body ownership, property rights advocation of, we'll say, it begins with the ownership of our body. And there is an area in which... Uh, you can find that uh, Christianity is also uh, in line with that. But some people will try to um, look at Paul's letter. This is a letter in which he had urged um, uh, Onesim Onesimus to return to his master, Philemon. So there, this is a guy who was helping Paul, was his assistant. And during this discussion that you read in there, it looks, you know, from some people might see it as, Paul supporting slavery because he tells him to uh, return back to his master. This is a day and age in which, of course, you will be murdered. You'll be killed, right, for running away. Yeah. Um, but he doesn't just tell him to return back to his master. He doesn't say, and be a slave again, right? People kind of, I guess, read that one part again and don't read the rest of the letter and the rest of the context of it. Because if they did, they'll see that uh, he is then he writes a letter and he's asking uh, his master, who is also a Christian, to treat this runaway slave uh, on, on Simeas as a brother in Christ and to treat him as equal and to release him from slavery so he may continue working in the church. Yep. Right. So I don't see it anywhere in there in that, in that letter that sometimes people will purport it to be as an advocation of slavery. Um, and they forget that slavery wasn't a Christian institution. That was a Roman institution. <laughs> that was a government uh placed in a force upon them. And this is how they have to respond and react to this. Yeah. And a, a, another thing is that not all slavery in that, t in that time period was what we think of as slavery. Some of it was voluntary um, indentured servitude, voluntary, because being outside of a group of people was a, was, it was, it was a tough life back then. If you didn't have property, if you didn't have a, a means of uh, providing for yourself, being someone's um, servant. And in a lot of those cases, that would have been considered the, the same word. Um, it would be considered slave too. So not, not, I'm not saying it, none of it was, but um, a lot of it was not what we think of as slavery. Right. They were like teachers sometimes and yeah. they would teach children. And yeah. And, and Paul calls himself a servant of Christ. I mean, some translations could use slave of Christ, you know, but he, I think he tries also to put it in terms that people could understand, you know, in the, in the way they were living back then. I mean, um, but the, yeah, it's, uh, he, you know, he's dealing with, I mean, he, he's not, uh, it seems like Paul has a really rough life, you know, and to say that like, he's, you know, that he loves government or something when he gets killed by the government. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> how can he, right. Exactly. How can, uh, the apostles turned to the very system that just slayed Jesus. Right. Didn't. <laughs> right. Yeah. How, right. So how can people look at these uh, texts and these responses to think that's uh, that because the they want, they want to find it in the text. Right. That's, um, they're, they're looking to find it and it's not there. Right. And being um, Easter, uh, even uh, Judas uh, repented. Uh, well, I guess he showed regret and remorse for turning him in, right? Yeah. Um, against the government or against the, the Jewish tribe and them turning them and seeing the inevitable outcome of that would have been. Um, 
Yeah, I don't find, which, especially when he sees to, says to him to treat him as your equal, mm-hmm. right? That's a, a very anti-slavery <laughs> uh, position to have, right? Yep. So, um, I, I, and I think uh, in terms of that, even historically, you look at, um, a lot of people don't really know this, like, why do we have an end to slavery, for the most part, worldwide, except for, I guess, Libya? Uh, we owe it all to a Christian man. William Wilberforce. Uh, he's a guy who had championed uh, the cause to end slavery because he saw everyone as also children of Christ and them as being brothers um, in this crusade for to bring about Christianity to the rest of the world. And he had spent his whole life, decades of it, uh, championing this cause. And he, had, he was a politician, but every time he brought it up uh, to parliament, they shot it down year after year all the time. I guess until eventually he just wore on them <laughs> and they finally put it up in which they finally passed it. Um, and then boom, all over the world, since the British empire t- reached, uh, what's the saying? The sun never sets on the British empire. And it sure uh, was the case when this happened, because everywhere that they had an influence and control over uh, slavery was abolished. Uh, not from the, just from the Caribbeans all the way to India, all the way um, that they had uh, exerted an influence and control over. But a lot of people don't give credit to, to the man who got this accomplished, he got this done, and he, was, he did it because of Christ. He did it because of uh, our religion. And under no other religion has this ever been accomplished through, of course. Under no other um, name uh, in Christ has this ever been accomplished or advocated so strongly and successfully uh, accomplished. Uh, he, he died, this is the wild part, he lived just long enough to see it passed, the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833, uh, passed in the House of Commons, and then he died three days later. Wow. Hmm. So he lived just enough uh, to see it uh, bring to fruition uh, and this uh, anti-slavery and to see it as always equal being brought to life. That's, that's amazing. What a, yeah. an accomplishment if there ever was one for, <laughs> for a man. Um, but yeah, William Wilberforce. I, there's there's no holiday of him that I've, I've know of. I, you know, you think there'd be statues of this guy? Uh, no. uh, yeah, but I think he's a uh, Protestant, right? I guess you'd have to be. Or I think he was Anglican. the equivalent of an evangelical now. Evangelical, right? Yeah, so he he can't be uh, canonized as a saint then, right? <laughs> well, you know, the church, uh, by you know, on further to their own credit, I mean, the Catholic Church. Um, was, uh, uh, you know, gradually, I think they were ahead of their time. I'm, I'm not an expert in the way the church dealt with slavery, um, but, you know, in South America and, and whatnot. But I mean, I, I know that there was um, a broad consensus a lot about from a lot of priests that you treat slaves as um, members of your parish, you know, and, and you uh, minister to them, even if, you know, even if you know they're slaves. I mean, there's a number of, uh, saints who, who, you know, did that. So, um, but it, I think, yeah, I think there's, uh, and, and just, you know, it, I think there was a lot of ways in Europe too, that they transitioned out of slavery, um, because of, you know, actions that the church was taking. Right. Even here in the U S you had your, um, your Quakers, your anti-slavery movements, you had your, Lysander Spooner um, influence here in this country. Yep. I don't know what uh, religion Lysander Spooner was, though. But. Yeah, he strikes me as probably Not a clue. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but you, so you go on to talk about um, "Thou shalt not steal," right? Respect for private property. So this is where Christianity starts to make us look good, right? <laughs> uh, where they can't use it against us, and yep. uh, there's a great. I I read um, this book, The Church and the Market by Tom Woods, and he quotes a ton of different um, popes and encyclicals throughout this thing. And one great one that I I remembered in preparation for this um, was Pope Leo the 13th. And he said, what's that? My favorite pope. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Guy, that shows well. 
So he, get, he goes into this uh, encyclical and he says, the socialists, Leo explains, hold that by thus transferring property from private individuals to the community, the present mischievous state of things will be set to rights in as much as each citizen will then get his fair share of whatever there is to enjoy. Such proposals are emphatically unjust and would rob the lawful possessor, distort the functions of the state, and create utter confusion in the community. Indeed, the remedy they propose is manifestly against justice, for every man has by nature the right to possess property as his own. So a swift, swift condemnation of um, socialism vis-a-vis -vis private property. And, uh, uh, you know, it, you, don't, you don't really hear anything crazy until like Pope Francis, basically, about, <laughs> in regard to socialism. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's just, well, you're, I don't know uh, what to say about that. I'm pretty sure every pope up, up, up until the last two condemned it in one in different levels, but, um, every one of them co condemned it in one way or the other. Um, right. Pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Pope John Paul II obviously lived under it, um, and under, you know, was in close contact with it. So uh, obviously Polish and they had a horrible experience under the Soviet union. So yeah, you, um, there's and yeah, there's way more examples in that book. Um, Tom Woods goes through, and he's obviously he's he writes this book as a sort of a speaking to the, the traditional Catholic community, who's often doesn't like libertarianism for different reasons. They think it's libertinism, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Tom Woods is also a trad cath, uh, written many books on the subject, um, which I guess makes sense. I guess his uh, love for history eventually inevitably ties to um, the epic of the book that uh, he wrote, uh, Catholicism uh, Building Western Civilization. And it makes sense then, I guess, in your research. I don't know. I guess he was a Lutheran at one point, right, before he converted. Um, but yeah, I, I found like my history, my love for history drove me towards uh, traditional Catholicism myself too. And yeah, you find... Uh, <laughs> and, and in terms of uh, libertarianism, it's not uh, far removed from a lot of popular people that are also Christians and well, uh, Christian li uh, libertarian Christians. Sometimes I, I hear sometimes there's like, uh, are you a libertarian Christian or a Christian <laughs> libertarian? Um, uh, so you have your Tom Woods, you have your Robert Murphy, you have your Lou Rockwell, Gary North, um, Ron Paul. <laughs> uh, he can't be wrong, right? But right, I going yeah, yeah. It's uh, and it's interesting also when you look at uh, the people that have been around Ron Paul, like uh, Daniel McAdams, very traditional Catholic, uh, Tom Woods, Lou Rockwell's Catholic, and and so you wonder like why uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, and it's um, it, it, you wonder like if this is such a libertine uh, ideology or something. I don't, I hesitate to use the term ideology. I don't, I don't really like that, but the, um, you know, if it's a set of beliefs and principles that are, um, totally in conflict with Christianity, well then why are all these Christians? Um, so, you know, especially very strong Christians. Uh, so, so, uh, adamant about it. Right. I think, go ahead. I'd like to go, uh, a little bit, take it a step farther. I don't think, um, libertarianism can um, can survive without the influence of Christianity or moral system. Um, well, you, and I don't want to jump into a different subject, but when we have um, all the sort of depravity that that happens around us, let's just pick one: pornography, and we you know that it's been used as a weapon in um, in um, by by some countries. Well, I'm not going to jump into that. I'm, I'm going to avoid that subject. You know, the um, next show. Yeah, for the next show. Um, but anyway, it, it is used as a weapon, literally a military weapon. Yeah. Um, so, and I think if you have depravity all over, you start to lose. You can't hold on to the to your freedoms. You just can't. So, I think having a moral force. Not, I'm not saying everyone has to be Christian, um, but you if you have to have some moral force keeping everybody in line. Otherwise, you will have the chaos we're accused of. Um, if you just have everyone doing their own thing with no with no moral compass, it, it will become ugly. So I think you do have to have that moral compass and maybe not Christianity, but you do have to have something guiding you. 
Fair. Right. I see uh, what happens to countries where they've become too secular and they've rejected Christ, whereas their history was all about, uh, that was their identity. Like you look at France um, and they're too afraid to say Christianity is the best. Uh, they're too afraid to say, yes, uh, this is number one. Um, for social justice reasons, political sensitivity reasons, uh, they want to say everyone's equal, but and all religions are equal. Uh, but none brought about, again, William Wilberforce to end slavery. <laughs> none brought about uh, Western civilization and all the great uh, sonnets and music and greatest literature, like uh, like 85% of like the world's best works of arts and architectures come from uh, Western civilization um, and hasn't come from anywhere else. Um, sometimes they'll say, well, you know, look at um, uh, the wars under Christianity. I said, well, look at the wars under atheism. Look at uh, USSR, right? Look at uh, communism, right? Um, brings up to our, our next point here. Uh, what I love is uh, if we find a lot of these uh, people that are very anti-communism, um, and you f- I have this uh, quote here from a bishop elect from the Diocese of Bhutan, Cosme Damien R. Almedilla, and this is still along the respect for property rights. And he says, espousing the communist ideology is not compatible with Christian faith. Communism is an atheistic ideology, and in a sense, is anti-religious. Uh, it reminds me of. Um, like how much other places uh, hate Christianity so much that you had a m- moment in USSR's history, communist Russia's history, in which they wanted to get rid of a Sunday uh, because it brought people together and to their beliefs and their religion. Uh, and they found the threat of Christianity and the authority to God uh, in competition with what they want obedience authority to the state. Yeah. Uh, so for like, can you imagine having no Sundays for 11 years? That's how long it lasted. Wow. It was funny. I, I, the, 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 the church that I um, belong to, or the, the, um, it's, it's, it's part of the Antiochian church, and they used to be connected with the Russian church. And when the Bolsheviks, Bolsheviks took over, they intentionally gave the Antiochian church their, I don't want to use the word freedom, but they, they, uh, they separated from them so they wouldn't be corrupted by the Bolsheviks. They were so terrified of the communists, um, the, the church of Antioch separated so they wouldn't be influenced. Um, and the Russian church did that. Um, that's how afraid they were of communism. Hmm. So. Yeah. It's, um, there's just so many examples of, uh, life being so much more difficult under the totalitarian state, the, um, the, the communistic state in the, in the 20th century. And, and you know, you can ascribe, both the Soviet Union and and Germany in during World War II, but like it's just that they and in in Germany too, like they tried to supplant Christianity with like an alternative because they know that there's so much competition coming from Christianity that they have to kind of supplant this alternative version, and so they they came up with positive Christianity, and uh, so there's there's always that, and I guess the the communists in, in the Soviet Union just said forget about it. But what I find so funny is. You have the full 20th century of this indoctrination occurring. And yet, even Vladimir Putin, who uh, his mother was, was still Christian when, when he was growing up, and she, uh, she, would, she would maintain those beliefs. And, her fa- and his father wasn't, he was an atheistic, uh, you know, commie uh, party member. But it's funny how, and then, and then Putin then ushers in this great era now for the, the church in um, Russia. And you're like, isn't that... Um, just a, a knife in the heart for, for communism. They, they, it can't yeah. compete, you know, with, with Christianity. When you think about it, it had all that time to try to beat it and it still couldn't. Right. No, agree. Uh, agree. There's also, uh, <laughs> this amazing priest, uh, that he should also have his own holiday. Uh, his name is, um, uh, Laszlo, Laszlo Tokes. Uh, he's a Romanian and he was, um, Hungarian pastor from R- Romania and the government tried to uh, evict him from his church, uh, from his church flat. And the people there were just, uh, has had enough of <laughs> communism up to that point. And then the communist government, the Romanian communist government attempt to evict him and him refusing and uh, standing down uh, was enough to trigger the entire country 
into revolution uh, and to overthrow communism and Romania and then to finally uh, shoot down <laughs> the dictator uh, out in the open. Uh, and they haven't had communism since. <laughs> nope. Um, I think John Paul was uh, played a huge part in the in the fall of communism too. Um, I think without him, the, the the West may not have accomplished because I think he had priests inside of Russia and other places working um, against the communists. So no, I think he was the Catholic Church played a giant role in the destruction of, um, or at least the fall of um, that part of communism. Right. And, uh, and of course, if USSR was so successful in thinking like, uh, yeah, look, uh, all these Russians uh, don't like uh, Christianity. All the churches are gone. Like, well, what happened as soon as they collapsed? They went back and unearthed all their relics and unearthed all the, all the stuff that they had to hide <laughs> all over the country. Uh, yeah. Good for, for them to realizing like you can't hand this over to the church. I mean, to, to the state and to, uh, one day there'll come a time when it's over and we can bring this back and bring Christ back uh, <laughs> into the country. So in terms of, you know, if you can't beat them, join them, right? As they say. So in this day and age, uh, you had, you know, after the fall of communism, you begin to see, and maybe even before, um, you begin to see this liberation theology and uh, John Paul II trying to stamp that out in South America. And then you see uh, Evo Morales, your boy, uh, get, uh, hand a commie cross to um, Pope Francis. It's got the communist symbols on it. And you think, well, this is now the next strategy, right? Is to try to get um, uh, communism involved in, in the church so that they can, because uh, they couldn't just totally supplant the church. They kind of mm -hmm. had to come up with an alternative strategy, right? Talking about uh, yeah. cultural Marxism, yes. Uh, the, the foundational pillar of Western civilization. If it built Western civilization, they found they can't out-militarize, they can't um, outspend or through any other economic means or through philosophy, uh, then one, why don't they go after the very thing that built it and holds it all together? Um, the church. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so that's... That's a, a crazy thing to imagine, like uh, Europe without the church. You will have what's happening in France versus where you have a people that embrace Christ and embrace, embrace God. You have Poland uh, and their country, uh, a, a poll they, put, they, put, they said together, who is the king of Poland? And the people of Poland said, Jesus Christ, that is their king. Uh, amazing. And they don't suffer any of the... Uh, horrible things that are happening to all the other European countries that have uh, forsaken Christ. And from their point of view, it makes sense. If you can take away a nation's rudder, you can push every kind of vice you want on them, which will degenerate a society quickly. Um, once they have no, once they're just floating around randomly, um, they're, they're an easy target. Right. Um, every sort of vice that will destroy a, uh, a nation is just, it need, it's easy. Um, but when you have a church, they're saying no, 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 which is good. Sometimes it's a bit more difficult. So they have to destroy the church before they can destroy the West. Right. <laughs> I hear all these, uh, birds chirping around here, like a uh, snow white. You want me to close the doors or is that okay? Or? <laughs> uh, no, we're coming here to, to the ramp anyways. Um, okay. I think we've been touched upon all the, the good points and the good questions, uh, in terms of the compatibility of libertarian ethics and Christian ethics. Um, you know, it, people say the, even the federal government here in the very beginning was very libertarian, right? Yeah. The, the least yeah. amount in terms of their experiment of, uh, government grievances in terms of their violation of rights, it, it attempted to create the most, uh, way to control that and limit that. Um, and then to espouse that these rights were come from God, from our creator, right? The bill of rights, that these are areas in which government cannot touch. Uh, and, and that it's not something that is granted from government. And so, you know, that's very libertarian for most of the Bill of Rights area that, that we see there. Um, so I think uh, when people look at libertarianism, not just the libertarian ethics in terms of property rights and respect for that, you find a lot of similarities even with the commandments with thou shalt not steal 
and the great rich history that we have against a, a great threat like communism that did everything but, you know, uh, violate property rights and, and the deaths that have followed. Yep. Um, but yeah, I want to thank you. Is there any last uh, points you guys uh, wanted to bring up on that? No, everything else will lead down other rabbit holes. So yeah. Maybe yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Was, and I do that way too much. So I, you know, you have to sort of rein me in sometimes. No, no, good. I mean, the, the Tanja's ones are great. Uh, we'd love to have you back on the show. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, this is a, the first segment of a mini series that we want to go through. Uh, like another one would be like dispelling common myths. People will think like, Oh, you know, Christianity is very really anti-science and um, they'll forget like astronomy. Most of the humanities were founded through Christians. The big bang theory that was uh, posited by Christians. Uh, and it was, uh, laughed at and scowled by, by atheists at such at, at that theory itself too. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of, uh, areas that I'd love to go over with you, both of you. And, yep. uh, but this is a good place to wrap up, uh, the compatibility. Um, okay. but thank you for having, <laughs> thank you for being on the show. <laughs> Thanks for having <laughs> Justin. Me. Yeah. Um, with that, with those, uh, watching, uh, stay liberated. Get off my property. Thank you.